So the Battle of Verdun began on February 21st, 1916, and the French had been pulling men and resources out of the Verdun area to reinforce other, er, other sectors of the front. They also hadn't been doing a lot to build basic fortifications, barbed wire, concrete bunkers, entrenchments, that sort of thing. And there was one guy in particular who was really a whistleblower that this was a problem. That was a guy named Emile Drian. He had been in the French military, uh, boy, 20 years before the war. He had been an assistant to Minister of War, uh, General Boulanger. Boulanger was forced out for political reasons and, and that kind of tainted Drian's career. So he eventually resigned his commission when it was made very clear that he wasn't going to be promoted uh, very far or any farther. And instead he ran for the National Assembly, you know, the, the legislative government of France. He won a position there and was in the National Assembly when war was declared. So like pretty much all former army officers, he re-enlisted uh, and he was given, he was put in, a, a, in command of about 1,300 chasseurs, infantry troops, out here uh, at Verdun, which was at the time an out of the way sector. Like you're not gonna get in anyone's way. We don't care about your politics. We don't have to deal with you out here. He was very concerned that there weren't enough defenses uh, being put up at Verdun, that it was a weak point in the French lines and it was ripe for, uh, for German attack. And he turned out that obviously he would be right. Well, because he was in the National Assembly, he was able to leapfrog the regular military chain of command and take his concerns directly to the civilian government, uh, who investigated it, found that uh, they agreed with him about the potential weakness of, of the front out here, and they forced Joffre to start doing at least a little bit to reinforce this sector. This obviously wasn't, wasn't, didn't make Drian popular with Joffre, but uh, it would turn out to be a, a pretty prophetic uh, recognition on Drian's part because February 21st, the Germans launch a major offensive uh, at Verdun, like a huge offensive, one of the biggest of the war. And Drian's men and Drian himself are on the very front lines of that attack. This is Emile Drian's uh, command post in the Bois de Cay um, at Verdun. You can see over here, there's a the remnants of a big shell that took out a corner of the bunker. Uh, Driant and his men would fight here on the 21st. By the end of the 21st, they held their position, but uh, Driant's 1,300 men had been reduced to 180 uh, still combat effective. On the 22nd, um, they, they continued to fight and Driant was unfortunately killed by a rifle shot while bandaging one of his men, trying to help evacuate one of his men. So he would go on to be uh, a basically a, a French martyr of Verdun, one of the few guys who recognized what was going to happen and did his best to, uh, to prevent it. So it's hard for me to show you the inside of the bunker here. This was a command post, so there's just one long open building. However, if we go back and look at this section under that collapsed portion of the wall, you can see, and just barely see, the roof has caved in and there's a big old chunk missing out of the floor. So uh, something fairly traumatic happened back at this, this end of the bunker. I believe it's been reinforced since because this is open um, as a place that people can visit and they didn't want the roof collapsing on tourists. Now, if we head over just a few hundred yards from the bunker, we will get to the place where they, where uh, Drian has been buried. Even today, a hundred years later, this landscape is basically nothing but trenches and shell holes. You can see the remnants of the old trench lines. You can see all of the craters, even after a hundred years of erosion. This is in the heart of what the, the French would designate as the red zone after the war, the area that was too contaminated by unexploded ordnance and gas contamination and all the other detritus of war. It was too contaminated to be able to rehabilitate. And so this area was reforested and left without agriculture and without people. Unfortunately, uh, this is the, the road down to the tomb 
is actually barricaded off right now, but you can see the, uh, the monument stone right there at the end of this little road. This is only a couple hundred yards away from the command post. And then there is a more substantial monument to Driant right across on the other side of the street. Uh, Driant was originally found and uh, buried with military honors by the Germans, largely because of his rank. Uh, his family was informed of his death uh, through Switzerland, actually, through a Swiss uh, emissary. When the French retook this ground, uh, they, they exhumed his German grave and they uh, reburied him in their own way as uh, basically one of the hero martyrs of the Battle of Verdun, one of the guys who tried to prevent uh, the tragedy that was coming. He certainly did his best both before the battle and during it.